Welcome to the stage, Assistant Curator at the Whitney Museum of Art, Rue Hockley. My name is Rujeko Hockley, also known as Rue, and you know, it seems very loud. I'm very happy to be here with uh, Jesse, my friend, and Hank, my husband and friend. Um, very, very happy to be here. We don't get to do talks very often. We certainly don't get to do them with, you know, the likes of Jesse. Um, so we're just gonna have a chat for about 60 minutes, I was told. And we have some slides that we're gonna be cycling through. We're not gonna stop per se, though we will touch on a couple here and there. But I wanted to start by, I don't think we, you guys know who they are. We're not gonna introduce them beyond that. Um, how did you guys meet each other? How did you come to be in each other's lives? Jesse, you go first. We met, good evening everybody, hi. Um, we met, I was, a, I was introduced to Hank's work and loved it. And I had just began acting. I was, had just moved to LA and in some interview, I bigged him up. I listed him as one of my, an artist that I really like. And soon after that was published, I was at the Hammer Museum in LA at, uh, I think the Now Dig This show. And his mother, Deb Willis, came over and introduced him to me. You want to meet my son? Um, he did not. This is, how um, Hank, this is how Hank meets most people. Uh, but we met and immediately started talking and we, I think, tucked away in the corner of the store there for like over an hour talking and immediately started talking all the time and figuring out ways to work together and he's been my brother ever since. Is that how you remember it? Uh, yes. I mean, I remember actually the best thing about Jesse is that he is uh, very hard to actually um, pin down in like how you, all of my predictions of how he would behave and who he was uh, this was very early on in your career where just like I kept being like oh he's not like that no he's not like that or he knows about this and so I kind of realized um how the kind of when you read about somebody in a magazine or you see them in commercial or on television you're just like oh they are their character and um it was really fascinating just to get to know you as a person with uh curiosity and ambition um around using the platform that you were developing at that time for things that um, serve the greater good. I Thanks. think... Oh. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I think, well, the first time I remember meeting you was at Art Basel in Miami at an art fair, which I thought, um, similarly, I think we all, we think we know people who we see on TV because that's the nature of the medium. Um, and I remember being really struck by your kind of deep knowledge of the art world and of artists. Um, and at a fair, an art fair like Miami Basel, that is where you're kind of just surrounded. It's pretty notable. So I'm kind of curious about how did you, how did you get into the arts kind of writ large um, to kind of becoming a creative person, but also then specifically kind of the fine art um, as a collector, as a person who's really involved in the arts, in the visual well, arts in that way? I mean, I think I was always surrounded by art. My mom's an artist. Her whole family are artists, boat builders, sculptors, dancers, painters. Um, so it was encouraged. We all painted in the house and that was how we expressed ourselves. We made our own gifts. We also were on welfare and couldn't afford gifts, so we would make stuff, and that was a, that was a better gift. It was a more it was it was highly more highly regarded if you made something for someone instead of bought it. So that was wasn't anything we felt ashamed of. It was actually a point of pride to create, um, and I was surrounded by just a ton of honestly like propaganda art growing up. A lot of my parents are both very political, so a lot of like um, labor propaganda art everywhere. So that was an immediate fusion of politics and artistic expression. And so that, but then we moved in my young life so that my mom could switch art schools, like, which I only say because art was so primary and important that it affected, it uprooted us and moved us somewhere else. So it was always not a, not an, um, addendum not not some kind of accessory in your life it was central and um so that that just grew and manifested and i went to film school and 
I started with photography, which actually I was forced to do as part of a punishment because I beat up a kid that called a girl a nigger in my class. Wow. And, um, but it was an interesting way they handled it at the school, and it turned out I had to take an art elective with this kid, and who turned out to be a, actually a really great guy, just was confused. Um, that's a different story, but a really interesting one. So um, basically, that's a fascinating way to get kind yeah. of forced into thinking creatively about the world. Yeah, it's, it put me in a dark room. I fell in love with photography, and I, I mean, dark, you know, um, photography became my therapy. I would just hide in the dark room for hours and just create. And, and even then, that work was inherently political. I was trying to find ways to say something, um, uh, both with the word, with literature, and, and with the image. Uh, and that grew into producing and directing, and then ultimately, screw it, I'll just try to do it myself on camera. Okay, well, don't get ahead of us. Oh, what is that what you asked? What'd you ask? I mean, I have more okay. questions. Okay. I have a tendency to run on into other things. But I think it makes, I think, because a, a lot of what you just said to me, I think Hank verbatim would say the same things himself about mm -hmm. his own kind of coming up as, a, as an artist up to and including your mom being an artist. So can you talk a little bit about kind of that because I didn't know that you were a photo a darkroom nerd as well well I just have one good you know I know your brother can build boats can you build boats no most of the talent skip me but the rest of my family members are amazing my brother is a boat yeah, builder but my, I've got three uncles that are boat builders and sea captains and sailing and boats are a big part Brother's of our life an illustrator yeah and Matt is an incredible illustrator artist shoe designer yeah my family's pretty dope yeah um yeah, so my mother, Deborah Willis, is an artist, an art historian, and a curator. Uh, today, she just was awarded a honorary doctorate from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, where she went to school. Um, and I really got this amazing experience of watching both my mother and my father um, follow their dreams. And yes, that meant that I was along <laughs> for the ride. And while there was, you guys were three, I was an only child. Um, there was a lot of, that's a sense of destabilization. I also became comfortable with the understanding the consequences of following your dreams that like part of actually taking risks is actually doing things that put you and people you love in uncomfortable spaces. And if you're fortunate and diligent and uh, build the, the correct network, actually, you may, maybe actually not only creating safety and opportunity for your family, but also for all the other people who are now interwoven. And so that has become part of my way of navigating the world. That, uh, that's interesting. It's making me just think about while watching my parents as political figures and my mom as and a political, politically motivated artist that in some ways de-incentivized it for me because we were so broke my whole life. Like it became a scare. The idea of following your dreams really seemed like kind of bullshit and scary because I was living with the consequences of it. I don't know that I've thought about it in the same way, but watching you- That's only 30 years it, later, like uh, 40 years later. Cause, no, no, yeah. no, then it was just kind of like, okay, art, but yeah, you can't just like not do anything else because you're gonna. We don't have any yeah. money. Well, that that's basically um, what I'm. I don't feel saying. that way now, but it was just I, I'm realizing it informed some of my processing. Well, someone asked me, yeah, someone because I actually going on a record saying I never really wanted to be an artist because all of my mom's friends were broke. Right. But you know, many of those artists like Carrie Mae Weems and Lorna Simpson and uh, Dawood Bay and many more have now been able to not only manifest their dreams, but also be a part of that with so many others. And so that was the long lesson yeah. that it's not gonna, the payoff is not necessarily gonna be immediate. Yeah. It may not ever come, but there is something really, I think rewarding for me in recognizing that that is not the point of life. The point of life isn't to get rich in material things, it's to, to actually learn and grow and hopefully get rich in the communal things. Yeah. Yeah. But I had that my adolescent spot. mind was not there yet. <laughs> but also but the fact that you and your brothers are all artists 
says that you were probably right, proves following that we pushed, me. Yeah, yeah, we didn't quite give up yet. Yeah, I walked in there backwards too. I was just like, I don't want to do this, not doing this. Yeah. You're like, I'm not doing this. I'm just going to go to college for photography. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I mean, it's, you said it's only 30 years. And I think what's important about that, particularly in terms of the fine art world, um, for black artists and artists of color in general, but I would say arguably also probably the film and kind of media world is that in that 30 to 40 year span, the idea that you could make a living mm -hmm. as a black photographer is, is viable. And it kind of wasn't. Like, I mean, I think the generation of artists that your mom and her peers came up in, they, the expectation that being a, that you would have your only job would be to be an artist was a, no, they all had like 16 jobs. And your mom still has 16 jobs, even though, because that mentality is so ingrained. And actually you both also have like 16 jobs. So maybe this is just being an artist, but I think it is also coming out of that idea that this is precarious. Um, and that's maybe not why we're doing it, but we also have to live in the world. Um, so I'm curious, we've been cycling through and we've seen a couple of different slides um, of projects that you've actually done together um, or projects that perhaps Hank started collaboratively and invited you to participate and to collaborate with him. So I'm curious if we could really specifically talk about, I'd love to hear about Question Bridge um, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about how Question Bridge came to be and then Jesse, how you kind of came into it. Sure, so um, a project called Question Bridge Black Males that uh, my, uh, was originally entitled Question Bridge with, that one of my professors um, Chris Johnson had done in the 1990s and it was really based on the idea that technology might be part of our um, greater connection and healing and that through asking questions and using uh, video um, we could actually perhaps bridge gaps that we would never actually be able to bridge otherwise so that um, in that case he was video recording people asking questions of other quote unquote black people that he they felt different or estranged from and then he would take that question to a different community and that, show that question and i saw some of that footage in from the 1990s and was really kind of blown away by the way in which these strangers were having what felt like a really rich dialogue about things that are not easy to talk about and I realize that within the context of just black men, there is a, such a diversity of identity and perspective and ways of navigating the world and seeing the world that it'd be really fascinating to actually facilitate a conversation between African-American men. And basically right around the time where we maybe had shot a little bit of it is when I met you and you asked me what I was working on. And, and, and then- Here's Jesse. Yeah. Question <laughs> Which, um, and it's, it's brilliant. It's, it's a really wonderful concept and we executed it in a way that I'm really proud of. Um, so what it turned into, right, is you have this kind of, we assembled hours, 150 hours of, of some, something like that, of footage of uh, black males asking questions within their demographic. Why do we refuse to go to the doctor? Why, you know, how do I know what an uh, eight-year-old boy, how do I know I'll become a man? How do I tie a tie? Or really deep stuff. I, I, you know, old heads, I know y'all look down on us and don't like the way we dress and the way we wear our hair and our music, but you didn't leave us the blueprint. I got no, a lot of us don't have elders in our, you know, crack ripped out adults of our community. Uh, we don't have anybody to school us. We don't have, why don't you leave us the blueprint? That's a deep, really interesting, profound question. And not only did they ask questions within this demographic, they then sat while we showed them other people's questions and they answered them. So we assembled them in this kind of Brady Bunch style on these 10 foot pillars all over the, the country and, and outside of the country at museum shows. And you're watching and edit it in such a way that these men who've never met are having a really personal, private question and answer call and response dialogue, conversation, megalogue, about really personal, interesting things, some things a little more generic. Um, so you get a look into an in-group conversation in an artistic space, often institutions that as a practice are, have a history of excluding you. Um, but you get a really personal insight into it and we would go, we yeah. had them all over the place and you'd watch people weep. I remember being in Salt Lake 
for the show and this uh these two white women maybe in their 60s coming out crying and being really moved that they saw the humanity in, a, in her words i saw humanity in a place i absolutely did not see it before i just clutched one of them said i just clutched my purse at a man in a whole foods at in the whole foods parking lot today and he looked like the neurosurgeon right there that i just that was on display like it was a really profound wonderful yeah, it is a um, wonderful profound that's project. the thing well basically what really i call projects like Question Bridge, it was a vulnerability, a generosity project where we wound up having over 170 questions from the, at least that many black yeah. men, but they also in answers. And I had to tell, I was given the opportunity to challenge my own prejudice where I would like, we go and I was like the question DJ. So I'd like show people questions, be like, oh, this person's going to answer this mm -hmm. question about like criminal justice like this or blah, blah, blah. And without fail, I was always confronted with the reality that it's obvious to me that it wasn't really about black men. It was about people. It was about what happens when people are put into groups, how they relate to the notion of the group, how they find agency within the group and also how they relate to others who are like actually navigating those same things. And every single person does it differently. And so why I thought it was powerful as a three hour multi-channel video installation that did go to like 25 different states and different mm -hmm. museums and it was overseas um, and is still in, up in the Smithsonian was that people get that experience of being like, oh, I really had this person perceived this way. Yep. And now I have to rethink them, how I relate to them, but also how I relate to my own self, because how would I answer that yeah. same question? And it displays there's more diversity within this demographic than there is outside of it. There's no such thing as black men do this. There's no possible answer you're going to give that's accurate. There's, and, and what is a group? A lot of these, a lot of our subjects review, you know, showed us that the only thing making us a group is you telling me we're in a group. Otherwise, I don't feel connected to, we're all human beings living, walking, everything, having a different walk. So that was a really, a really spectacular examination of, of humanity and one of the things we, we poured ourselves into for years. But that's, I mean, that's when you first came to Summit also. Because that, that's when we first, you, like, or maybe a few years later, but I remember you telling me about Summit then. Oh. And you had also just moved to L.A., uh huh. And started. What year was this? I don't. Well, we met in 2009. Yes. Because that's when I first started. Like. But we finished it in 2012. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had come here before. The, you had came here in like 2010, 11 okay. before we even finished it. Wow. An eternity ago. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I was just thinking about how the person you were as your relationship to your own craft as an mm. artist had changed from. 2010 where you just moved to LA. Yeah. You, I don't know what you call it. You didn't have a bit part on Grey's Anatomy. What was your part at the beginning? It was, just, it was the same part. I just had never acted before. I was starting. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was trying on a different, a cost, I was trying on a different life, a way to earn a living and steer my own life, which was really clunky. And I didn't know what I was doing and putting my, my destiny in my in somebody in other in a whole engine's hands that i didn't know and was just trying to figure it out and luckily was able to keep most of myself well, and you did that for how many years who did what grace it doesn't matter who okay. can count but seriously like a decade it was the, it, and you just stopped like two 20. years ago two and a half two years ago yeah. so i'm just thinking about that that arc from like meeting you right at the beginning of that journey and now that being, you're kind of at a new moment of rediscovery. Oh, for sure. And yeah, these last couple of years have been pretty profound. Well, it's just the beginning of a career as an artist in this space. I started acting and I immediately got on one of the biggest shows in history. Which, and that show shoots 10 months a year. So I didn't, couldn't do anything else. Amazing opportunity, wonderful, all that's baked into that. But I was in the building looking out at other artists being able to create and begin and end different journeys and explore and make mistakes and skyrocket and plummet and i was just in a safe i was in a safe fortress so i could raise my kids and sleep in my own bed and be there and i don't regret it but it was different than now since i put that down i did the opposite i went to broadway and was freaking you know the lead in a Broadway play. That's way harder and way different and it pays zero dollars. <laughs> and it, you know, and it's terrifying. Yeah. 
I mean, I was doing the thing I realized, I was talking to my friend Stefan, I realized I was doing the thing that people use as a joke that's terrifying, like I was actually naked on a stage. <laughs> It's not something you actually do. It's so you think about what would be the most mortifying shit you could possibly do. I didn't do. think you were going to do it. And that was it. So, um, only up from here, I guess. Yeah, now you did it, so. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. It's done. That's done. That's, that's <laughs> over. That will not happen again. Um, not tonight. Yeah. Well, I but, think, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I think of both of you are real, look at, on the front cover of Playbill, I mean, look at that, um, are both kind of polymaths. And like, I think both, I mean, being, having been together with Hank for 10 years now, I am constantly like, oh wow, a new, there's a new way for Hank to be an artist. Like Hank has found a new way to be a creative person in the world, um, which is kind of an incredible thing to bear witness to. Also kind of a like nerve wracking thing to be around. And I'm curious about, because both of you are in industries in which you can kind of do the thing you do and keep doing it and be fine both you know, creatively, you get a lot of accolades, successful, and yet even just looking at this, we have activism, we have apps, we have kind of engaging in school space, we have theater for you, Jesse, and Hank, public sculpture, collaborative projects with multiple artists, a fine art practice. Um, and so I'm kind of curious if you can talk each a little bit about, I'm very curious, Jesse, about your various side hustles, let's call them. Um, but then also how you kind of synthesize it, like how it comes together and why it feels kind of ingen like generative to be that kind of polymath. Like what's the motivation for doing Ibroji and for doing homeschool and for being in the web space as well um, as all the other spaces that perhaps are more traditionally yeah. occupied. I don't by know what it's actors. Center what it's I don't seek to I don't have a center and then make sure things line up, of course. I just, just stay my, I just try to stay myself and do the things that interest me. Um, and maybe that's less common in my particular line of work, but totally common. And I mean, Hank is the most prolific, constantly creative, astounding artist that makes me think and rethink so differently about things that are in my life. Thank you. And always, it's, it's, it's so exciting. And, and part of that is, that's, that's uh, fitting as a fine artist. It kind of seems, okay, that's the space you go to when you constantly are creating, you can't stop yourself. Um, I think there's just expectations or might be just a little lower in my line of work because like, you're not. an actor, most people just act. I'm, not, I'm a curator at the museum. I work with a lot of artists and most artists aren't. This guy. Not like that. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. So, um, so I think it is kind of unique, actually. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I think coming from, I'm never going to leave the social justice space or education space or things that I think working black people need. That's how I was raised. That's what I care about. And that's what I'm in service to. So like anything, everything else, if things can serve that, things can, I can go out, go do something else that will maybe serve that down the road. Things that are really direct and political and in your face, things that I just need to take a break and lighten up because I need to take care of my health. It, whatever it is, it's just kind of, I'm just riding a wave. It, uh, I wish I say I had some kind of plan. I just do what I think I can do when I think I can do it. Um, you know, and you know what? It was a big pivot for me. Hank was on me for years to get an assistant. Mm -hmm. And I was, and this sounds so simple and basic for people. It's like, nah, I don't need nobody else in my life. Like, what are they going to do? They're going to be in my life. Like, they're going to, they're going to be in my house. Like, I don't, what am I going to, I don't know what they're going to, what are they going to, I'll just, I'll just, I, I so assigned, uh, torture, like self torture, grinding yourself to the bone with being a man, with being a husband, with being a father, with being a person. I thought that was part of it. Fuck how you feel, who cares how tired you are, how you, you're, what you're, and you have no ac access to your emotions, all these things. That was my, re yeah, that's, that was just what it was. It wasn't it was self-flagellating, it was just life. And learning to like ask for help, figure out how to get help, stop starting a thought with no because. Mm -hmm. You know, all that, it was around that time that like I finally let his advice in. I was like, okay, I'll try it. I don't know what to do with them, but okay. And I've, I've started to figure it out, and it's incredibly liberating. Somehow the work doesn't stop, but it, it's just, it's, it's really a, a big help. And that seems like a little a basic thing, but what I've always admired watching your practice, Hank, is the amount, the way you are able to delegate. 
and delegate in, in an empowering way. And people are building and forming and shaping something really interesting that they can be proud of and have a claim to, even if you're the captain of the ship. And just that's a really important skill in life, not just in work. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to learn as we go. We've had some success, like Bleverty did really crazy well. Yeah, the apps are doing well. They're doing, they're doing fine. Um, I think part of that was also, there was a tear during, you know, before they called it Black Lives Matter, but like when I was on TV a lot and I was in the streets a lot and I was continuing that activism work and um, it's, it's unpleasant and it's taxing and it's exhausting and doesn't really align with the way I was attempting to make a living. And that's fine, uh, and that was fine. It didn't adjust anything. But after a while, I was also like, we also liked, I also like to chill and have fun and be funny and play games. And all these things are about like keeping it unpredictable and what are other things that I can do. My dad used to always What's say, happening here though, real quick? That's in Ferguson during October after Mike, they killed Mike Brown. Um, we're at the Ferguson police station. Um, and that's in Florida getting, um, uh, formerly incarcerated people, the right to vote back, uh, which we were successful in. Um, the, but um, what was I going to say? Uh, the, my, it, yeah, I remember early, uh, my parents got divorced when I was in junior high school and I, was, I moved from an all black world to a white suburb and was figuring that out in my adolescence and it was angry and figuring shit out. And I remember as I started to mature and kind of figure out things I wanted to do in my life, my default, like anything I did, my dad, one of his questions would be like, how is that helpful to black people? And that's a heavy thing to put on a kid, but, <laughs> but it, it if, you know, it's real. And we are in a state of, we, we are not in utopia. We're not, it's not, we're not on a balanced playing field. You can't just, uh, in that line of thinking, do whatever you want to do, or you can't damage the process. You don't have to be in service. You don't got to be in the streets, but you can't get in the way. And, um, I think that, you know, that, that in, informed choices. And part of that was, um, black joy is an important thing to represent and encourage. And we are constantly in a battle with, um, under and misrepresentation and representation really, really, really matters. Um, it gives birth to entire generations of people that will pursue something. You kids pursue attainable goals. They do things they think they can do because people who have something in common with them have done it. Um, that's just, that's a very rational way to be. I remember when I was teaching in the hood in Philly, like I, I was talking to my kids, but I get it. I get why you would want to, why would you come to school when you can make $200 on the, on, the, on the corner? You don't know anybody that knows anybody that knows anybody that's benefited from a high school degree. Oh. That ain't real. I don't, that's, that's not real for millions of us. Like it's got, so, so like me creating spaces for measurable success and fulfillment, that's, you know, a huge part of why I would love African history and teaching it um, to anybody, not just us. Um, so all this stuff is, is connected, just trying to round out a shape. Yeah. And what about you? Did you forget? I realized question? probably that Somewhere around the pandemic, I self-diagnosed myself with ADHD because that was the only Just thing to explain why I, I crazy that like, I have like an amazing idea, the <laughs> best idea that I could have ever had. And then, call Jesse at 2 a.m. and tell him about it. <laughs> exactly. And then start like get started on it with like a bunch of people and then be like, ah, you know what? Stay right there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back. And I'm going to start this amazing idea with like these people. And then like start taking people from this place and be like, let's go do this. And, and I realized that like, I, yeah, I don't, I can't focus. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, Tina Belafonte here, who um, is one of those people that, you know, once you leave the room, that good stuff starts happening. <laughs> so I also recognize that a lot of people who I can, I've actually been able to connect with and work with were like, I was right both in bringing them there and leaving them to work their magic. And like, that's been really beneficial for doing projects in, in front of Statue of Liberty and in Ireland and South Africa and uh, Four Freedoms Park is that like, I am very, very, that's my, I see constellations and I'm very, really fortunate and good just to see the world and be like, oh, what if JR 
and so and so and so did this at Four Freedoms Park. And what if I just call this guy over there? And then there's this art fair where if we get Sharon shot to to like send us an artwork, and then we create a news channel, right? And then that'll be the thing. <laughs> that was just in one month, right? <laughs> Literally, it's from start to beginning. And and then let's do it at the Brooklyn Museum at the same time. And so, but which that, also hosted Question Bridge. Yeah, but that but that that's my like that's actually my zone of genius and. I've actually more recently now that I do recognize that habit, reckon, wondered like, what, how would my life be if I didn't need like 500 people to be invested in something for anything that I want to manifest? So I really started like, in many ways, kind of stripping down my practice and just focusing on like, what can happen in the studio, what I can do uh, which is when I was in the dark room in high school and college, that's what I, that's how I got into art into photography is that I really loved the solitude. I loved the, the experimentation with materials and ideas. And there is this reality that now everybody has a camera that's better than the one I had in high school on their phone. So there, so I, I will never get that kind of joy and gratitude and, and affirm, affirmation from making the art the way I used to. But, and I do get, great joy from being able to call B Mike and be like, can we put your billboard up next to the Brooklyn bridge or Aja Monet who, um, you know, asking her to do her first billboard and also seeing how many of these people have intersected with summit is actually something I also think a lot about. Well, I think that the way that you're talking about kind of as you self-diagnosed your ADHD, but I think a lot of people had also what do you self think? I, I had self-diagnosed it many years before you did, <laughs> along with that. many people. <laughs> I think I told you, I did tell you, I'm not a doctor. Anyway, but I think that what I am hearing kind of about the, even regardless of that, but just thinking about a next stage of kind of your growth as an artist is also about simultaneously more autonomy, but also more, enmeshment if that's a word embracing right? embrace yeah embrace that's the good word we could use but i also well we can talk about the embrace um but i i was i wanted to also ask jesse about moving into per being a producer and being a director because i see that in some ways as being analogous um in your kind of in the kind of theater movies kind of that side of the creative space I think it probably is actually that's uh, because you can come in, kick around a ton of ideas, trust people to work. I don't have to have all the levers at all times and let it, you know, blossom. Um, yeah, I would say that's a, a pretty and also getting to know yourself and your level, your energy level, how much I've got to how many any time. Really, I view a lot of things now as any time or energy I'm giving to something. I'm taking that away from my kids mm -hmm. or something else. I could be doing that. I re that really is deeply important to me. So make it count. Mm -hmm. and um, just try to be efficient without suffocating things and um, trust and watching it, watching it come back. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of, Hank, you said kind of shrinking down the amount of what if you made work that didn't depend on this stadium of people. That's um, a really interesting question. It makes me just... Like how that how is that going and what 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 is that? Because I know it's going to go well, amazing. It's going to just pro put things out differently. Th there was I, I have had these experiences in my studio relatively recently. People are walking there like, wow, now this is really good. And I'm like, what, what, what about all the like ten years of other stuff that I did or twenty years of stuff? No, no, I didn't care for that. <laughs> like, but this, like, it's fine. I actually it's think fine. you're really onto something. I'm like, but this was this did not require like all of this work and crazy fundraising and all of this other stuff. And so I'm also having to like, I also recognize how much I felt like I always have to prove myself and prove my worth by actually like getting validation from everyone and everything that I can do this and I can do it here and I can do that and hope can't you and this person see all of this other stuff. And I have the privilege of having so many other friends who are just like, I just do things that I like. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend was like, I was just closing my eyes, just looking at the guy and I saw the sun and I realized that was God. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna just do some paintings to God. I'm like, <laughs> that's what you woke up to do today? Well, and so like, many people think about, I wanna do things that other people like. Yeah, well, and that, is that's my different. thing. I'm like, I realized I was so much in this external gratification realm that I wasn't even really, and, but it was not even 
for approval because I would have been making things that were prettier and easier if that were the case. But like that, like what I think about is important matters to other people or like, and if it doesn't, I'm going to find a way to make it matter to you. Yeah. Well, I think it's also the thing of kind of what you were saying, Jesse, about this perception that to be valuable, whether it's as a man, whatever identity position, even just as a human in the world. And I think as a black man, I would assume as a non-white person in general, the assumption that you have to like do, 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 and you can never stop doing, because if you stop doing, then you stop having value and you stop being, you know, the art world is fickle. Like all of these industries, creative industries are fickle and the perception that there's only so much available, you know, like a scarcity mindset. I think even when you know that you don't think that way and you're telling other people don't think that way, sometimes you act that way. Totally. And also in your role as a provider, exactly. I've got to provide. Yeah. So I've got to have something that is creates stability in the most unstable of exactly. practices in like the most unstable of <laughs> circumstances, which is the world. Yeah. It's you know, a pretty world. absurd intersection to build for yourself. Um, but well, for me, my experience of when you committed, cause you were going to leave grace for a while wanted to you said yeah yeah you, you were like i'm gonna leave this is it this is it and then they'd be like well actually yeah. i've never seen numbers like this yeah. <laughs> and then like i'm gonna leave this is it i'm tired i don't want to yeah. do this anymore which uh, and it seemed that the more successful you became and like certain people were getting killed off and all like every other thing and i'm like when is jesse gonna like not jesse yeah. <laughs> like, like when's he gonna mess up she just like <laughs> gets hit by a car or something but um you actually exited the show to do something that nobody that's you said it but like nobody leaves basically the biggest show on television to go to a broadway show about a gay baseball player where which requires you to bear all on stage with what nine other dudes I, well there was only one other dude on stage when i was there but yeah but it's like a very and, I, and like to me like i the depth of you as a artist in person to recognize that that was a greater opportunity for you than staying on the, the safe route you know and then the fact that a global pandemic happened to stop you from making that choice and then you waited till the pandemic was over to actually then spend. We were in our third week of rehearsal when COVID shut us down and killed all the plays. And, but then I, we were lucky enough to have an opportunity to put it back up once COVID was over. Yeah. But like that to me is also for me a variation of being like, yeah, this is that, that other thing, the shiny thing worked, but like that isn't really me. Right. So like seeing you and then like when I, well, I remember going to the show and like hearing a little bit about the news and being like, no, he's not really going to get naked. Yeah. And then like the fact that you just kind of like, like stood there, like in the light, like having these emotions and like going through all of this stuff of like this character who I don't even think that many professional athletes have had the courage to share their true selves in that way and but to, to like i'm curious about that emotional journey from you know being on yeah i i mean i think that hearing you say it reminds me that it, it, i needed to do something difficult i don't really feel alive <laughs> and I, I kind of fell asleep uh, things that are easy it, it, it's boring it's either there's a purpose for it. Maybe that was to put away some money or to be able to, like I said, be with, be able to see my kids every day or whatever it was. It's a purpose. It's a reason I put that. But then, but I needed to do again, those measures, early mindset measures of what it is to be a man that comes with a lot of obstacles, but it's also, you want, I like, you know, a lot of us like friction. I like something to push against so that I feel a reward at the end. So I actually had to earn it. There's a, you know, we, we talk as parents of young kids about the value of like, what was it like? We grew up with no money, but now we have a couple resources. Do I, are we gonna, what does that mean for how we raise our kids and their understanding and gratitude and appreciation for earned things that are earned? What is, what is that beyond a word? What is it to earn something? Does it have to be toil? Does it have to be hard for you to have earned it? No, but, but, um, and, but back to you know, that decision and to stick through that decision to do the hard thing. And it was really hard. 
um, was that that's what was revitalizing to me. Um, and, it, and I was curious about it. It was interesting that I wanted to, I need to learn. As soon as I graduated school, I missed school. I love learning. I don't feel alive unless I'm learning. Um, and, uh, but also to learn a different side of your masculinity through homosexuality. And that didn't like, concern me in the slightest. Not, can, no, I'm saying I feel like as a creative else. gesture, that would be like a pretty, like yeah. a lot of people oh, are oh, afraid to about, leave and look. Well, that, and that's, that's also side. the role of the, as a, a really awesome thing about being an actor and there's not a, some things are not that awesome, but is you, you learn a lot about the way other people live besides your own pocket. You get to really dive deep into the psyche and experience and smells and tastes uh, around different walks of life. Um, so that's, again, that's a form of education and, and enlightenment that I really do treasure about the process. How did you kind of come to, how did you and the play come to each other? How did me and who? The play, take me out. Um, it was offered to me, it was offered to me, it was actually offered to me years before that when I had like just started making money on Grays, like I had never acted before, so I didn't make money for a year. I kind of had a, you get these rookie deals where you don't, you don't make enough to whatever. But by the time I like finally did a new deal, probably when I was first complaining, telling Hank I was gonna leave, but I wasn't. And I finally got like a little bit of money, they offered it to me and I was like, I can't leave a 25 episode a year job that, provides for my entire family and extended family uh, to do a get naked on stage for zero dollars like that doesn't you got the wrong number um, and um, so and then it never happened and then years later I came back and it was like God calling me it was like yeah that's exactly what I'm gonna do it also is a spectacular play just reading it it is an incredible piece of material Richard Greenberg take me out just read it it's the you know it's very it's really dense and wonderful and smart and <coughs> painful it was strange um, i wanted it to be longer yeah, yeah we Actually, got that a lot I, once i like got into it I was <laughs> um but um <laughs> it's really see how fast he is write your complaint <laughs> leave your complaints in the box on the side of the stage i wanted the play <laughs> yeah to be longer yeah yeah, it was, it's, a, it's a dope play, which I can take zero credit for. It's, all this stuff starts with the word, with the writer. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was brought to me, but in our line of work, a million things are brought to you every day, and you have to also develop a piece, you know, a mechanic to be able to discern. You know, I've think, read things that were really, you know, you listen to music, like, it's an album, and you kind of, ah, whatever, I'm not into that, and then you hit, discover it five years later, and you realize this is the dopest thing the ever. Time, yeah. yeah, like, that's kind of, you know, that's the... Creativity, where, where are you at when you saw that mm -hmm. movie or saw that piece of art? It's very much about you. Yeah. Um, it's most things in life are between you and you, you know? Um, so so I, was, I was ready to receive that blessing. Mm -hmm. But and also seeing you at the beginning versus seeing you at, at the, I only got to see it twice. Yeah. But even seeing those two versions yeah. of yourself. It's a beast of a role. I mean, I'm a pretty good actor. So it was, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't clap just for kidding. that. Just kidding. You're so you're bad. Um, I'm mediocre at best. But it's a really great piece of material. And that's what you look for as an artist or an actor or whatever. What can I, where do I, I literally say, you know, where do I start and where do I end? What, what, are, where, what is the, the terrain that you have to contend with? And what is it, what do you learn from it? It's kind of like when I was saying about things being difficult. You have to, you can do it with 500 people. You can do it with two. You can do it with all your attention. You can just put it aside and come back. Like, that's what makes you feel real. I like to, I'm an athlete. I like to play basketball. I like to get like knocked around and knock people down. Like, I like to feel my life. Your knees. My knees are paying the price for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> if you missed it, oh. if you watched Jesse at the Celebrity All-Star Game, there's a really great clip of his knees doing the In the best. NBA All-Star Celebrity Game in Madison Square Garden, I tore my ACL, MCL, and both menisci in one knee live on television and like army crawled across the court in pain as they fucking zoomed a camera into my face. And like, I was begging Kevin Hart to like kick me off the court so that they had, I don't have to be on television experiencing this insane pain. So uh, thank you. And then all his friends are like, 
Dude, that was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. It just if it would be funny if it wasn't me. It was something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just I think I'm the scared. only just person to ever be like seriously injured in a celebrity <laughs> all star game. <laughs> it's not a point of pride. <laughs> Once you hard. Is it that me though? The the one it's just, it's just me. Nice. I'm trying to have the most painful tattoo in the world on. So just, I like I like, to I like round it out. Yeah, you're noticing a pattern in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, Hank, will you tell us about the embrace? Because I think... Yes, please. I'm just thinking about the time, because I think so often people see, oh, Jesse Williams, take me out. And it's like, that happened right now. But what we're hearing is actually the seed was planted many, many years before, and it took a while both for you to be in the right place for it, for it to come back post-COVID, you know, so many things. And of course, the embrace... You know, it's been, it's like a five plus year and in some ways, you know, five decade long <laughs> process. Sure, yeah. So I got this great opportunity um, to apply to do a monument to Dr. Martin Luther King, Credit Scott King in Boston Common, which is the oldest continuously used public space in the country. And um, never thought that I'd get it. So I was just like, let me just come up with the crazy idea of like looking. I, look, I saw this picture of Dr. King and Mrs. King embracing. And I wanted to like highlight that embrace. This and I was one. like, if I just wrapped, if I looked at those arms and I see how his weight is on her shoulders in that picture and how that was such a metaphor for their relationship and how there is love and intimacy that was a part of the civil rights movement that is left behind. And also to illustrate what public and civic love could be was an opportunity. And so I actually made this pr proposal, which I thought I would never get. Um, and then um, was it wound up being a six year process. It was like voted by the public. And then I had to go through all these hoops with the Landmarks Commission and the um, Parks Commission and all of th this other stuff. and. Um, in January 2023, we had this amazing unveiling that was one of the highlights of my life to have this experience of being there with Dr. King's son, Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther King III, and their only granddaughter, um, Yolanda King, and have her actually look, go inside of the embrace and say, look up, and she was like, it's like a portal. And she's like, I feel like I see my grandparents there. It was a really powerful, amazing experience, and really, and seeing like that what I had dreamt about really actually happened and and worked, in spite of it all. And then I had this amazing experience of watching all the, the amazingness kind of devolve into like a Fox News and Comedy Central um, melee. Which again, if it weren't me, it would have been real funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, so been like all, all of a sudden people see like uh you know because a big thing also was they w decided to make the unveiling private which i was just like how are we going to make a unveiling of a monument like this in a to public the kings space. in a public park and have a fence around it and i was like on the phone with the mayor's office trying to get it down trying to get it down and so then the picture that kind of started the firestorm was a picture of it behind the fence so of course the way it was meant to look and that all of us had ever seen it was not how it was perceived originally i mean on, on the news and on the media but so i had this real amazing experience of watching how the news works and how like clickbait works and how rage can be intensified um, and how humor can play into these things, but also how they say there's no, no such thing as bad press. And all of a sudden, like Kim Kardashian's going to do a talk at Harvard. So she's like, I got to take a picture of the embrace. And it's like, wow. And the people are texting me from South Africa and uh, Mexico and Switzerland be like, you're on TV. And I'm like, me? This is... And but also what would thinking about that, the kind of scrutiny of the artwork um, in the media and then having people who have gone who like wrote things critical, like, well, I just didn't get it. Like people putting in writing that they actually were wrong from their perception was also really powerful. But also recognizing that I couldn't put up a monument to love in a country that is so 
fascinated to, with hate and violence and expect it to be so easily embraced ironically that mm -hmm. I also had this opportunity to do what you know what Dr. and King and Mrs. King did throughout their entire public lives which was to stand in love stand in dignity and actually not fall for the the bait mm -hmm. so it was a really kind of amazing experience and then the guy who started the firestorm on Fox News just got fired so that's what he gets for messing with me that's what you get yeah <laughs> Um. I was so proud of that moment and that process and it's a really it's a really deep thing and it also you think about all of this work is you know we're going to be dead much longer than we we're alive all this work is going to live much longer than the moment who who remembers what was the hot headline 17 weeks ago or 17 years ago it doesn't matter like what lasts and what, and you're sitting in love throughout all of that, like uh, with some pushback, it's, uh, it further demonstrates the, the need for it and how beautifully it will continue to be received. It's great. It was also fascinating because we were like, well, you know, the only things they could compare it to were like the Statue of Liberty and the Vietnam War Memorial. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Eiffel Tower was the only thing. Like people hated the Eiffel Tower and I'm not, I wasn't to my own arm. But like if that's the only thing that yeah. you can compare my artwork to, right. This is right. kind of like... You can live with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not too shabby. Um, well, I don't know. Is there anything that we haven't covered that either of you would I think like to you get to the cover? idea. Yeah. Um, if anybody has any questions, that, that's okay. Oh, oh, oh. Hey. good morning. Oh. Candace. This, Hi. Yeah. Hi. What would you like to do um, a big art step, a white art festival as a black man? I've never been to a white art festival. Um, but you mean Burning Man. I, I, I can read through the lines. Yeah. You mean Burning Man. Yes. Um, um, I don't believe in race, right? So I recognize that, you know, the people who created a race made it so that they can win. So if, well, I can't subscribe to a race where I'm automatically the loser. Um, especially when I'm playing an infinite game and therefore will never lose. Um, but at Burning Man, which was a very, I've been go, I've gone to like five times to Burning Man and, um, I lived in the Bay area for 20 years, for eight years before I went, went there. And I always was like, I'm never going to Burning Man. <laughs> like if those people have fun there, I am definitely not going. <laughs> And um, in 2014, two of my collaborators on a project called The Truth Booth, where uh, we made a kind of inflatable truth booth, um, a, uh, it's a confession booth, basically. And they took it to Afghanistan. And they had, and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to Afghanistan. My friend told me that I could never be confused with uh, special, special forces, but I was just like, just in case. I'm like, I'm not going. Um, and they took it and they had this amazing experience and I was like, yeah, I just messed up. And, um, I was then they were like, now we're going to go to Burning Man. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm not going to miss Afghanistan and Burning Man. <laughs> that was my logic. And then we went there and we were like, try to put it up and like, we our whole thought we were going to go there. We we're going to like make fun of people. It's going to be real fun and great. And we tried to put it up, put, put our sculpture up in like the universe. If you've ever been there with the playa was just not having it. And so like all of a sudden, like we're like stuck in the middle of the desert with like a dusty, dirty, inflatable <laughs> speech bubble <laughs> and had to just like basically lick our wounds. And so we basically just sat around and couldn't make fun of anybody. Um, <laughs> and then eventually we were like, actually these people were kind of cool <laughs> and like s sooner and sooner or later more people just like this guy came up to me he was like hey you're beautiful are you mr beautiful and i was like um <laughs> sure <laughs> and i was like and he's like yeah and then like from then on i was like trying to like figure out how to negotiate like being called beautiful in this you know when you're friends with this guy you know and this woman um i realized that there was something else going on when a total stranger could just like walk up to me and share that um, with me. And 
I think in 20, and then like a few years later, my friend Marsha was like, oh, I'd love to like, oh, no, two years later, I tried to bring the sculpture back with a new team. And the whole team was like, nope, we're not going. And I was like, fuck, I got like 11 tickets. <laughs> That's when you came. I had to go. I, Jesse still won't come. But he had a TV show then. He's like, no, I got it. Yeah. He was. He was. And then, then like two years later, Marsha was just like, look, I, I have an idea. I would love for you to do something in Burning Man. I was like, I'm not doing it. And then I just put up an Afropic sculpture in Philly. And I was like, well, what if we try to do this? And she raised the money, got Rich Medina to come. We built the sculpture. I st stood back and let my team kind of, because it was basically the same people wouldn't go two years before, so I was like, I'm not helping. This is the idea, this is how it's gonna go. And basically they succeeded in putting it up. And um, I mean, we had our technical diff difficulties, but it was really profound because I was the first quote unquote, I don't think it's true, person of African descent to put up a large public sculpture at Burning Man. It was an 18, 20. 28 foot, well, Aaron Gilbert, another artist, not Aaron Gilbert, oh, oh God, Aaron something. No, an A, Aaron. But another black sculptor had a sculpture out there at the same time, but I got all the credit. Um, but Aaron Douglas had just launched the Black Burner Project. What's the name? Aaron Fowler. Right, yes. And so he, so we were up there at the same time. Um, how are you doing? Good. Um, and yeah, it was like a really profound thing to see, like actually music that I wanted to hear on the playa to actually see like all of these black people show up and actually engage. And then people who don't identify as black actually feel that they were having a different kind of experience with the soundtrack, with the sculpture and also acknowledging the power and the beauty of black experiences and soon after i was like walking through the play with my friend kambu Ilishimi, and another guy stopped me and he's like what's your name I was like mr beautiful he's like is it because you see the beauty in everything and everyone and i was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i so and i realized that it was like never really about me uh -huh. and so what i love about burning man is that like and both of these guys were would have identified as white and i don't know if they were quote unquote straight or gay but I would never have thought that like a total stranger who doesn't identify in the way that I would identify through my racialized lens with would be like would see me better than I could ever see myself. And so I really think everybody should go to Burning Man, get dusty, get burnt, hate your life, think you're the dumbest person in the world. Because <laughs> Aaron just did an incredible sculpture there where I tried to talk you out of <laughs> last year. Um, but also making space for um, people of African descent to feel that they also have a place in this ancestral land where most of the people who populated then are not, um, you know, the original caretakers of the land. So we all have a lot to learn. And, and I like the fact that society is finally recognizing that what little was not destroyed, we can hopefully still uh, benefit from. So. so you promise you're coming now. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be there. And then sh Simon, he's going to come to Carnival too. Oh, okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves. No, no, no. Let's do that first. <laughs> Sorry, no offense to Burning Man, but let's do that first. Um, okay, well, these are great promises for the future. I think that's a great place to end. Okay, thank you, everybody. Unless Jesse would like to say anything. No, I do want to um, just shout out uh, the video team backstage because this yes. is just kind of like randomized images. We haven't spent any time with them, and they did like a really beautiful job of when a topic was up, finding it. We never identified them for them, and like... Amazing. Thank you. That was that and was then, great. We appreciate you tonight. Thank you, Dante's. Yes. What's that? Dante's. Yeah, Dante's is going to be popping tonight and every night. Yeah, the best thing about Burning Man was being there at sunset with Rich Medina playing on on Robot Heart. Yeah, that shit was crazy. Who's, who's rocking right now? Yeah. So let's go. So we're yeah. gonna go there. We're done. Yeah. Here. Thank you. Let's do it. Thank you all. Oh.